support recommended moving them to Timmins. What did the citizens of Kasechewan say? They said, we don't want to move. We want to live in our traditional land. We want to stay here. You have to recognize the connection that First, Nation, First Nations people have to the land. The land is their life. And you can't just say you need to privatize reserve land and, and, and make inputs into the free market. I mean, for First Nations people, the land is like your mother, like your grandmother. And how do you parcel up and and sell your grandmother. I, I would mean, argue it's not, that, it's not that, a, a formula sure. that you just lay on a First Nation and expect them to develop. They need empowerment. They need, you know, whatever you want to call it, self-government. They need to be in control of their own destiny. And you'll see the results. And you see it across the country. I think preserving culture is a noble goal. It's an important goal. But it's become such an overarching goal that it has now become more important in our public policy no. than, to, in my mind, the more important objective of saving lives and making sure people have the blessings of our integrated, urban-based capitalist economy. No. Now, the, the two of you appear to be uh, heading, uh, if I may, maybe I'm wrong about this, maybe the perception is different, but you appear to be trying to get to the same goal, you different approaches to it. Mm -hmm. You say integration is the answer, the same opportunities as everyone else, the same kind of uh, socio-economic opportunities. You're saying no, the, the uh, principle of self-governing, of taking care of our own selves is yeah. the key to that. Absolutely. How can that, give me an example of well, how that could be more of a key than going into, than integrating into general Canadian society and working with the same opportunities as mm -hmm. everyone else. Sure. Well, it's interesting. Uh, at Harvard University, they've, they've undertaken a 30-year project on American Indian economic development. And they found a number of things, but the number one factor in contributing to stable and fit First Nation economies is self-governance. So the bottom line is First Nation peoples need to be in the driver's seat when it comes to, to economic development. I mean, it's not more assimilation. It's not integration. I mean, I understand that Mr. K suggests that culture is what's blinding us to, you know, enacting some kind of economic development scheme on First Nations people. But the federal government hasn't recognized culture. The, the, the policies over the last, you know, 10 decades has been one of assimilation, you know. Abandon your culture and join our society. And we need to reverse that and, uh, and end it. But how, individually, explain to me how that works. How, uh, give me one example of how um, any, any aspect of self-governments mm -hmm. will lead to more economic stability and social stability for a First Nations person at risk. Okay, well, I, I mean, what's a First Nation person at risk? Um, but. It, it takes many forms, for instance. I mean, we throw out terms like self-determination, sovereignty, autonomy, self-government. I mean, what do these things mean? I, you know, I can't tell you exactly what any of these things mean, but the, the principle, the fundamental principle, is that First Nation peoples make the decisions themselves. In British Columbia, the Squamish Nation, uh, Usuyus, Millbrook, Lac La Ronge, I mean, these are communities that are taking control of their own destiny and moving forward. In the North, Anishinaabeaski Nation, yeah, with leadership like John Bocage and Stan Beardy, who well, recognize that they need control and are trying to take it and wrest it from the true government. True autonomy, true self-determination can only exist when you have a, ta a local taxpayer base that is underwriting all of the society's projects. My problem with self-governance, as it's applied in Canada, is that the money is coming from elsewhere. So you don't have local Aboriginal governments who are fiscally responsible to a taxpayer base. So it essentially becomes welfare economics in another form. You call it self-governance, mm -hmm. but without a economically responsible government that's taxing its own constituents, but is, is instead, yeah. that is instead Absolutely. getting its money from Ottawa, mm -hmm. that to me is not yeah. true self-government. So well, unless you have economic sustainability, you cannot have true self-governance as, as you want to do. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with that. And uh, I think in many instances, um, self-government, I mean, we haven't really tried it in Canada yet. I mean, we haven't really tried in earnest well, self-governance. Well, there's NISCA, yeah, but I mean, the NISCA, the NISCA it's, it's young. It took 100 years for the NISCA to achieve self-government, 100 years struggle at least. I mean, what you're talking about is access to capital, right? I mean, tax is one way of generating access to capital, but what First Nations people need, or how First Nations people can access capital, is through the timely settlement of land claims. So, no, to me, it's about human capital. In, well, in a modern economy, human capital is much more resource, important. Absolutely. So and, there's, and two, there's two factors economy. here, then. But if you talk there's, about resource economy, absolutely. it ends up being very capital intensive. You talk about oil and gas exploration in native lands, that's great. Mm -hmm. It pours hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars in, yeah. but it doesn't create jobs, it doesn't create education. Is this discussion going on, frankly? I mean, the, the First Nations discussion are, are so fraught with uh, so much passion and emotion, and rightly so, because the stakes are so high. Uh, 
Jonathan first and, and then Hayden, when you proposed this, were you shocked at the kind of reaction you got from the First Nation community? And do you think uh, there's a political correctness that is in some ways stopping really helpful discussion? The, the people I blame, first of all, in terms of the Assembly of First Nations and tribal leaders, their response is predictable. They represent the constituency of Aboriginal leadership. They like the current system to the extent that it gives them uh, power to spend money, it gives them some political power. They don't want a system that dilutes the power of First Nations band chiefs. In terms of the federal government, I think, to my mind, what symbolizes the complete lack of engagement with the issue is Kelowna. Kelowna, Paul Martin went, he claimed that it was a fantastic solution to Aboriginal problems. It was just more of the same. It was $5 billion more going toward the existing scheme. And they don't want to challenge the existing scheme because no federal government official wants to be accused of racism, intolerance. They don't want to be accused of challenging uh, Aboriginal cultural autonomy. So yeah, I, I think the sort of debate we're having here is very good. It's not ha happening in government because government officials are too risk averse. It's not happening in government, government at, all, at all, but that's because government is unwilling to do the things that they need to do. And our discussion just a minute ago spoke of how do you access capital. First, the timely settlement of land claims. Second, education. We need to spend, send as many First Nation kids to post-secondary education to get a formal education as possible. Um, those you know, two. A lot of people out there are going to say, well, there's free education. Absolutely. For but kids, this, so. is, this speaks to my next point, what the government has to do. Settle land claims and, and the funding cap. First Nation kids can't go to university. It's a treaty right. Education is our buffalo, and uh, there's not as many First Nation kids going to university as, as there should be because there's a, fen a federal funding cap limiting that number. So we need to end that funding cap. The First Nation population in Canada is the fastest growing. It's the, it's the most populous under 24. Um, I mean, these kids need an education, and these kids are going to be the First Nation future. Now, these two things are fundamental to shaping, you know, to, to changing the status quo, yeah. and they're both... Uh, in the government's court, and they have to make the action, and it's inaction by them. It's not political correctness. If you want, if you want to give education, uh, secondary, post-secondary education to natives, the best way is to ensure that they're near good schools, that they're near job centers. If you look at the statistics, appalling statistic on Aboriginal, Aboriginal reserves, two percent of the population of reserves have university degrees. Two percent of the that's population, right. we need and to that's not because, that. but that's not because of funding caps. It's sure, because sure it they is. do not generally right. live in environments where they are near universities, where they are near. Uh, urban are you centers. telling me that people in rural towns don't go to university? But there's are a, you there's saying the government population. won't fund any more? Won't Pardon fund any more First Nations kids to go to university? Absolutely. That there's a lineup there's a waiting for yeah, money? Absolutely, on oh. many First Nations. Look, right. As I said before, funding isn't the problem. The problem is a culture that imprisons okay. people in reserves as opposed okay. to bringing them to. We gotta go. Thank you both very much. Thank you for coming in today. The conversation will last a while. We'll be right back.